The city is alive with activity. You Hi, I'm Dave Evans, and welcome to 999. NYC Media knows everything about the city. And now you can take us with you everywhere you go. Our new iPhone app has tons of information about places to eat, things to do, and much more. Download the NYC Media app from iTunes and discover New York. This week from New York Times TV. Go behind the lens with society photographer Patrick McMullen. Christopher Gray looks at architectural chaos on Broadway. Next, the minimalist Mark Bittman takes on urban grilling. And a Metro reporter follows a police scanner for a night. These stories and more from the New York Times. Last week, we got hold of a police scanner and we spent the day driving around New York and chasing down as many dispatches as we could. The idea was that in its own squelched, frantic way, the police scanner presents the rhythms of the city. Sort of a hidden layer, only a fraction of which ever winds up making the news. We started out in Midtown. Then at 10.05, a call came over the breaking news page of reporting a male shot on Lexington Avenue near East 111th Street. But when we arrived at the location, there was nothing. Hey, officer, how are you? Hey, how are you doing? Good. There was a report of a male shot on East 110th Street? There was no male shot. It came over the radio, but it was unfounded. Nothing. It was unfounded. That happens a lot? Yeah. So we resumed roaming. Sexual advice, audition, okay. Then the pager reported shots fired in downtown Brooklyn on Borum Place. Seems a man tried to break into a light blue 2009 BMW, but he was confronted by the car's owner, who was a probation officer working nearby. Plain clothes on top of him, huh? holding the gun to the back of his head, yelling at him. Oh. So then the guy on the top, he was holding the gun on his back. He put him on the snow. Nobody was shot. A shot was fired, right. but nobody was hit. Shot. They caught him trying to steal the car. Not exactly CSI material. So we went back to roaming. Heavy traffic, scattershot locations, sifting through jargon and emergency codes, all made this assignment challenging. We headed toward the location the dispatcher gave for a suicidal EDP on East 115th Street. An EDP, emotionally disturbed person, is one of the more frequently heard calls on the police frequencies. This suicidal EDP happened to be at a counseling office in a public housing project. We beat the police cruiser and ambulance there by 10 minutes. Then we followed them inside. You guys are good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She basically said that all, like, that she just wasn't feeling yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So I guess that's how it came over, but everything is, yeah. everything is fine. Back in the car, the pace of the calls was quickening. We chased a report of a crime in progress in a nearby path mark on 125th Street and Lexington Avenue. Supermarket security and the police had collared a shoplifter. Nothing is boring in Harlem. And outside the market, a man in a green Statue of Liberty costume handed out promotional materials, and a group of women talked smack about the shoplifter. They do that sometimes. I, I don't know. It's crazy in here. Princess Jane. Oh, really? Vicious Raccoon at 2312nd Avenue. We heard, a, we heard a report that there was a vicious raccoon over on 2nd uh, Avenue, 118th Street. So this, this, is, this is a real odd uh, well, Yeah, I mean, we actually saw most of his body. It was, you know, a nice size. Yeah, so... And he came down, he was scared, and he came back, yeah, and he ran back up? Yeah. He probably got through one of the, uh, you know, uh, orifices of the building or something like that. Is it the first time you've ever had that? Yeah, problem? of course, yeah. Everybody was like, whoa, I've never seen one, yeah. I'd rather something fuzzy than something without a tail, or without a fuzzy tail, so... Yeah. Next, we headed to a call for a fire at Park Avenue and 95th Street. A little Street. bit of smoke goes into his apartment. Oh, a guy was using his fireplace? Yeah, and the smoke goes into his apartment, that's it. The scanner kept going. Safety is promoting prostitution in front of the location. Male Hispanic wearing a red vest that says cheater. Exactly is responding to box 2299. A lot of these things, uh, the fire calls just just don't pan out as fires. And it's interesting this neighborhood though. It did seem like the people are very interested in the firemen. And the firemen are staring at the people and. Superman's all over his office because yep. there's like a. It's Lower East Side nightlife here. 
third party caller said their friend texted them on, I mean, you know, wrote them on Facebook and said, please call 911 and put her apartment. It's three William on a third floor and her last name is Williams. Sergeant Wright, can anybody advise if the complaint on the victim? Next, photographer Patrick McMullen shares some of his secrets during a night out. All right, look, I like this. Is it, I wonder if this is accurate. Here, look. Ta da! Where's the photographer? <laughs> Ready? Now that's a photo op. You know, I work with New York Magazine and I work with a number of different magazines and I have my website, patrickmcmullen.com. We go out, you know, take as many pictures as we can of people, name people, not name people, pretty people, attractive people, funny people. Okay. Hey, there's Mickey Rock. What's happening, man? Good doing, to see you. It's good to what see a beautiful you, girl. When I was like around, I guess, 12 or whatever, I went to the guidance counselor at junior high school and. They says, well, what do you want to do? I go, I don't know, I don't know. What do you like to do? I don't know, you know, I don't know. He goes, there's gotta be something you like doing. I said, well, I like going to parties. And he says, well, forget that. You're never gonna find a job where you go to parties. So just forget it, you know? Oh, and you I, sell tall shoes. No, I saw nice shoes and beautiful clothes. And I said, I'm gonna get a picture of them. And here you're there, yeah. Her campaign girl. I love that. I love that my instincts are good. You're good. My approach is to dive right in, you know, like just to look. My eyes do the work, you know, I see somebody that looks good, I see an attractive person, and I said, nice dress, nice, you know, you gotta just, I, you know, it's all about the, the, the stuff, you know. See you later. Bye, baby. Being affable, it comes very natural for me when I see interesting and fun people like that party. It was easy to be affable. The, the girls were so pretty, the people were fun. I saw friends that I hadn't seen in a while. People seemed genuinely happy to see me, you know. When you stop and say to somebody, I love your style, and they go, oh, thank you so much. That's, that's nice. That's a fun, that's fun for me. Now one of you two together, yes. Yeah. Yes. Is this by you? Uh, come in for me, because I, I got 10 people waiting for me. All right, they got us all squared away, okay. Well, I mean, this is sort of a downtown party. Uh, the other party was more fashion-y uptown. This is an art crowd, social. It's like, you know, they're different, like, night and day, you know? I'm you, for sure. Hello, go up. I didn't even get to take your picture yet. No, oh, but you always take my picture. You must be bored. Well, we got to do it? No, I'm not. Ever. I'm well, never I like bored. That. I like that. We'll get the two of you together. That's great of Loretta Lux, right? I mean, anything that makes me sweat is work. <laughs> And I'm sweating. No, no, I mean, this is work, but this is nice work. I mean, I, I like it. But it's, uh, you know, there's a, there's a dissonance because I'd like to be here as an individual looking at the photographs and having time to, you know, enjoy them and not wanting to just photograph the crowd. But that's just personal. As far as work goes, I don't want to even talk. I want to take pictures. Okay, let's get you guys. You get in the middle. Chew, finish chewing. Streetscapes columnist Christopher Gray examines the eclectic architecture on Upper Broadway. New York streets and buildings are not just about brick and stone. They're about people. When you look down any street, you have to see a tableau which is not just architectural, but also human. I'm Christopher Gray and I write the Streetscapes column for the New York Times. Broadway is Manhattan's most chaotic avenue. It's a jumble of skyscrapers and little houses and brownstones and frame buildings and theaters and hotels and apartment buildings. And Broadway north of 96th Street has so many building elements, art modern and Edwardian and ancient and glassy modern. The architecture of Broadway in this section moved in kind of clumps. Some little old buildings from the rural area in the 1900s and then very quickly these six and seven story apartment houses followed by the 12 story apartment house and sometimes apartment hotel in the 1920s. It started again with Ariel East and Ariel West. These two tall, glassy things have infuriated Westsiders, drives them nuts. They're big and modern and fancy and expensive and especially different. You know, you think of Times Square, Broadway and Times Square as being the theater district, but theaters were strung out along Broadway, including in this little 10 block stretch, 
There were four at various times, two at 96th and 97th Street, uh, one uh, demolished for Ariel West, and the last is still surviving, the, the Metro, which was built as the Midtown. It's a lovely little terracotta gem in sort of pink and black licorice. When you stand on 104th and 105th Street and you take this old 1890 photograph looking south, you can hardly believe the change that's overtaken the area in just in barely a century, from open land and little truck gardens and to this thoroughfare of big steel and concrete framed apartment houses of the 1910s and 1920s, and then the more recent 40-story skyscrapers at 100th Street. It's hard to believe. And now, the minimalist Mark Bittman shares his secret to easy, moist, grilled chicken breasts. Chicken is always tricky. It takes a little bit of technique. And grilling chicken breasts, which tend to dry out really fast, is even trickier. I've got a solution for both. You want to start with chicken breasts that have the bone in it. I know you're all used to cooking boneless chicken breasts, but the bone will keep the chicken from drying out some. It'll absorb some of that heat and keep it juicier. And here you want to cut a slit in the middle of the meat, sort of a pocket. and you're gonna stuff that with what we call compound butter, which basically means butter with things in it. In this case, tarragon and chives. And we might as well, since we have some, and since it's melting in this fierce New York heat, put a little on top too, and perhaps a little in here. People love chicken breast because it's lean, but it's that very leanness, A, that enables it to cook so quickly, but B, that makes it dry out so quickly. So it needs help. And as I said before, the bone helps, and certainly adding some fat helps. And this is flavorful fat here. Think of basting your turkey. For cooking chicken in general, you want a hot side of the grill and a less hot side of the grill. So on this gas grill, it's a snap. I have this side on high, I have this side on low. What you want to do is let some of the fat drip off and the chicken start to cook all the way through over low heat, and that will avoid flare-ups. Cool side of the grill, hot side of the grill, okay? That wasn't fake. The chicken goes on the cool side for about 10 minutes and then we're gonna look at it. So it's been 12, 15 minutes. I'm gonna show you where we're at. So this has been on the cool side with the cover down. We've got It's really cooked pretty much all the way through and nicely browned on the bottom. Can move it to the hot side now and just brown that top. By then, they'll be firm and cooked, not overdone throughout. Say five minutes like this, and now you can leave the top up, and you can keep it on the hot side of the grill. Although, if it flares up, you move it back to the cold side. Simple as that. This guy is definitely done. Now, there are a couple other ways to cook chicken breasts without drying them out, but this is the one we're doing today. Bone-in chicken breast, stuffed with a little compound butter. You got that nice, juicy, buttery herb mixture in there. A little fresh lemon. Mm. That is as moist and tasty a chicken breast as you're ever gonna get off a grill. You might fault me for taking a lean cut and making fattier, but I'm making it better. You want good, juicy, grilled chicken breasts, you've got to add some fat. And this is really good. Straight ahead, A.O. Scott's critics pick this week is Broadway Danny Rose. I 
lovely, lovely woman, I hate to see her cry. But when I start to manja, I get the evil eye. My wool is getting stronger. How the hell would my go ma? Did I get it from my woman? Take the box and ask you that. Ah, the good old days. When were they exactly? Did they ever really happen at all? Who knows? Who cares? Nostalgia is not about the memory of specific people, places, or events. It's a feeling. And in Woody Allen's Broadway Danny Rose, it's an affectionate remembrance of a world that maybe never existed, a world of small-time New York show business. Excuse me. Hold it, hold it. Are you finished? Are you finished? Are you finished? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I have the greatest Danny Rose <laughs> story. The film begins with a group of aging comics sitting around a table at the Carnegie Deli swapping stories about the old days. The one that tops them all and the story that provides the meat of the movie is the sad and curious tale of Broadway Danny Rose, a small-time agent who specialized in clients whose talents lie elsewhere. You know what I mean? But the thing to remember is before you go out on stage, you gotta look in the mirror, you gotta say your three S's. Star, smile, strong. Star, Star, smile, strong. Danny's most important client, a half-washed up lounge singer played by Nick Apollo Forte, has a simple favor to ask his manager. Will Danny bring the singer's mistress, Tina, played by Mia Farrow, to his big comeback concert? It's a simple enough plan, but of course, nothing goes quite according to plan. What the hell you want? Oh, please don't upset yeah. him. Yeah, well, I'm not coming. You got that? No, no, no I want to speak. Not dead. Hello, Lou. Lou, yes, Lou, it's me. I got here okay, Lou. The directions were good. They were good. It was a golf station. Lou, she seems to be a little upset. Alan populates the movie with a lot of real-life show business types, including some as famous as the great Milton Berle. Alan also draws on his long career as a gag writer for comedians to produce one of his sharpest and funniest scripts. Yes, and what did your husband do? Um, a little bookmaking, some loan shocking, some extortion, like that. So you're professional. What'd you do? You divorced him or you got a separation or what? Uh, some guys shot him in the eyes. He's blind? Dead. He's dead, of course, because the bullets go right through. There's some broad ethnic humor, which is kind of an homage to the tradition of Borscht Belt stand-up comedy. He's got the evil eye. Child malocchio. You understand, figlio mio, il malocchio. Mama, he's a dead man. And there's an unusually curvy Mia Farrow in a captivating performance as the woman of Alan's dreams and the cause of many of his problems. You know what turns me on? No. Yeah. Intellectual. Really? And I'm not, I'm not just saying this to make you feel good or anything. You're a smooth talker. Yeah. Angelina once even predicted I would marry a Jew. She, did she happen to say which Jew? Farrow gives a heartfelt and genuine performance in a movie that otherwise might have been a slight and silly anecdote. But Broadway Danny Rose is more of a poem than an overgrown comedy sketch. Part of this has to do with the cinematography of Gordon Willis. He's the guy who shot the Godfather movies. And he gives every frame the kind of mysterious smokiness of dusty old photographs. Broadway Danny Rose, the man, is a has-been, a hustler, a washed-up, failed performer. But he's also decent, brave, and loyal. Broadway Danny Rose, the film, is a shaggy dog story, a joke. But it's also, especially for a Woody Allen movie, if you think about how misanthropic, how hostile he sometimes can be, this one is surprisingly sweet, gentle, and authentic. Coming up from the Metro desk, a bail bondsman gets the call from the famous, the infamous, and every man. I'm not judge nor jury. People make a lot of mistakes and people have to pay the piper. Whatever happens in the system, it's just a, a business decision for me. Bail bonds. Uh, hold on, please. What separates me, I believe, from a lot of different other bonds companies is my relations with my attorneys and with judges, with DAs. Everybody gets what they want. Hello? Good. What's up? I'm busy. No, no, no skips. No skips. Thank God right now. 
I have power to help get that person out, get him back on the street, whether it be a celebrity or not a celebrity. This is Ira Juddelson, yes. I'm looking at my wall right now and want to see the Joel Halderman case. You know, he was alleged to be involved in some sort of a blackmail of David Letterman. Or, but, um, you know, Lawrence has my cell phone number. I have his, and um, he checks in with me. a.k.a. Earl Simmons, also became a uh, client slash friend. Cat was under I the gun. The rumor on the street was he was getting, you know, a quarter million dollars for his appearance at Carnegie Hall that night. So we, uh, Kristen we checked in by weekly plus the bracelet, never a problem with the bracelet. A, a decent person, I wish her nothing. Uh, there were some guns found in, in their SUVs, so we, we put that together and we got them out the door real fast. I gotta be honest with you, there's a lot of sleepless nights. You hear a lot of ugly situations, a lot of cases. Morally and ethically, sometimes I have a problem with it. I wrote this bell, Melanie McGuire. She was convicted of killing her husband, putting him in a suitcase, and dumping him in the uh, Delaware River. I don't get as close to that type of person. You know, I still have to put food on my table. I still have to pay salaries. So I got to look at it as a business decision. One thing I, I want to make sure that I'm good at is being a father. I try to make every soccer game, every baseball game, uh, I haven't missed one yet. Hello? My yeah. wife sometimes says I don't know how to shut the phone off. My cell phone is my business. To be the best in my industry, you always got to bring your A game. You got to bring it. The bail bondsman, I did my job, and now, now the DA has to lift the shirt. Finally, another happy couple takes the plunge in this edition of Vows. It was clear that Brian wasn't only my best friend, but I wanted him to be my boyfriend and, you know, now my husband. We met in 2002 in September. It was. Ryan's freshman year and my sophomore year at Harvard. I was involved with the College Democrats and... I had impressed him at the intro meeting by answering a trivia question right and winning uh, a t-shirt at the contest. So we went to coffee, mutually decided coffee would be the thing. Um, we're not really that sophisticated though and at 18 and 19 we went on our coffee date and both of us ordered hot chocolate. I had a really good time, and I looked forward to doing it again. We committed to each other pretty quickly, and he visited my family in December. I visited his family then. With the exception of a brief time in college in 2004, we've, you know, Basically. been together ever since. We were each other's, uh, you know, first boyfriends, and that was scary, but and that breakup time actually in some ways solidified that I wanted to be with him. Mm -hmm. We made it official on Facebook at some point, so. Yeah. There was never a real, I don't think, decision to, to get married. It was, it was more a decision about the timing. In, I guess, 2008, it was a few days before the anniversary of our first date. I just sort of decided, you know, to myself, well, you know, on our anniversary, I'll pop the question, I guess. And this might not be surprising, but I, between the two of us, um, am a cookie lover, um, <laughs> the cookie lover, and probably all sweets. Um, but there was this one sweet that I really loved at, like, you know, a cookie shop in the mall in West Hartford. And it was clearly designed for children um, because they <laughs> put a little plastic ring uh, in the cookies. The night before our anniversary, I went to the mall, you know, half an hour before it closed, um, bought the cookie with the ring. Um, took it home, sort of squirreled it away. And then the next morning, I, you know, I had a, an anniversary card. Um, I gave Ryan the bag with the cookie in it, and um, when he opened it, I told him, you know, maybe we could get married. And I said yes. And we were engaged. I'm happy. I was a little surprised because I thought we would just have a conversation in the car at some point and say, well, you know, let's aim for 
spring of 2010 or something like that. But there really now was an actual proposal date. It was, you know, October 7th, 2008. Uh, October. <laughs> 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 Apparently on to October 9th, 2008. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, apparently it's a day that I'll remember forever. <laughs> <laughs>